with Peak Nutrition, and she's a, she's a runner. In fact, she's out at our rescue runs. Some of you may have seen her on New Year's Day on our rescue runs with a lot of clothing on. <laughs> but um, uh, I have asked her to come in and talk about nutrition as it applies to the SAR athlete. Um, from missions to sustaining uh, endurance uh, missions as well as that low um, low duration but high intensity incline missions and things like that. There's, this is the first of two sessions. Feel free to ask questions, whatever we don't cover that we want covered during the first one, we'll go into the second session. And I know a lot of the second session will be for people like me and Dave and Ski and Larry Dunn. What do we all have in common? <laughs> so, you know, she'll get into later about how to support the I'm getting older, but I'm not old yet nutrition. So with that, yours. Thanks. So I'm in private practice downtown, and a lot of the people that are coming to see me are coming to see me for sports nutrition, and that's simply because uh, they're aware of my presence in town and what I have to offer. It's certainly not the only thing people are coming to see me for because I also happen to have a couple of areas of specialty in terms of the medical world, but we're just going to assume everyone's in perfect health and we don't need to go into any of that tonight. Uh, I doubt you would have been able to perform these missions if you weren't in perfect health. So Patty has reassured me that I don't need to come from a perspective of how to manage weight. But just so you know, a lot of athletes are trying to do that. And that doesn't mean that they're underperforming in their chosen sport. It just means it's an ongoing issue they've been dealing with their entire life. So what do you guys think is popular nowadays if that's their concern? It's paleo or it's keto in terms of what's popular nowadays in terms of the approach if a person's uh, speaking code to me. So oftentimes people won't come flat out and say that they're concerned about a weight issue. Instead, it all comes across in code. But if you're a dietitian and you've been in the field as long as I have, you know what they're getting at, which is they're trying to achieve a look that they don't presently embody and they're not entirely comfortable with their appearance or their even their performance but they know that they don't meet the thin ideal. So why would I even go over that? Because I never know when I speak to an audience, no matter who the audience is, that some people in the audience wouldn't be coming from a paleo perspective. Because it's popular. If you just look at the phenomena of CrossFit, there's no way to dispute that it's popular right now. Does that mean I'm advocating for it? No. What it means is that when somebody comes to see me, I wouldn't be um, good at what I do if I said, don't do that, that's ridiculous. So I never do that. Instead, I get on board with whatever is important to them and then provide guidance based on, it's just not possible to bond and connect with somebody and keep them as your patient if you're telling them right up front that what they're going to pursue is um, lacking research in terms of its adaptability to sports nutrition. Now, there are plenty of people doing CrossFit that would disagree and say, this is really working for me. And I would say, come see me in three months. And that's when they will have run out of gas. And it's simply due to limiting their carbohydrate intake. So I'm going to take approach tonight where I'm assuming everyone in this room is entirely comfortable with consuming the food known as carbohydrate. And that we don't have to go down the road. Very much so. Thank you. You're making my life easy. But I factored it in because how can you go out in public in this day and age and not respect people's beliefs? So... In terms of prior, I understand you have very little notice. So you're not going to have hours of advance notice to have set an alarm, woken up early, and eaten breakfast. I get it. Patty was really good about cluing me into that 
you'd probably have time to grab things from the refrigerator. You'd have time, if that was true, to also grab things from your cupboards. But otherwise, you are also going to be dependent upon what you drive around in a car with 365 days a year, not knowing when you're going to get called out, and that you'd also be dependent on what you leave in your pack all the time in case you get called out. So based on this really valuable piece of information she was supplying me with, plus she was explaining to me that missions are of different lengths, and that I could count on a long one being, say, 14 hours, and that sometimes it would even be back-to-back -back with very little turnaround time between the two. Everything tonight is designed around those concepts. So the handout that I designed, I didn't break it down into short and long missions, and that's because I'm going to teach sports nutrition tonight, and you're going to become a label reader. And what that means is, if I teach a concept of 15 grams of carbohydrates, you're going to go and read labels and figure out what 15 grams of carbohydrates are and practice in your own time. And you might say, why 15 grams of carbohydrates? Because all exchange lists are based off of 15 grams of carbohydrates being one carb exchange. And you might say, what's an exchange list? Well, people that have diabetes read exchange lists. Um, people that do meal planning uh, are utilizing exchange lists. And it's because they're being told, consume this many servings of this type of food in a day. What I mean by this type of food is carbohydrate, protein, dietary fat. Okay, so based on that they have X number of servings from each food group on their meal plan, and the one you're focusing in on right now is carbohydrate. I'm just here to tell you that's what 15 grams of carbohydrate meant, is it's one carb choice. Okay, so prior to going out on the mission, here's something to know. While you're out there, you're going to be burning 70% carbohydrate, meaning glucose, and 30% body fat. That matters to you, that piece of information, in case a person was like, oh, I don't need to pack that much carbohydrate because I'm going to rely on proteins and fats. And that would be a paleo approach. But I just want you to know, it would be deeply flawed in terms of endurance athletics. So, you can't even count on the 30% body fat because you are assuming that you won't run out of fuel then and that you can utilize your own body mass to uh, make a go of this. And I just want you to know, you're going to lose power. You're going to have poor recovery if you count on that. So try to just ignore that you're going to burn some body fat. Because when people come back from an endurance um, event of any type, they are mostly dehydrated. They're not counting on the fact that Oh, goody, I lost weight in addition from having burnt body fat. So I think, that, that, I think that's an important concept because what you're really needing when you get back is to replenish glycogen as fast as possible and remain hydrated for fastest recovery. And everybody knows what glycogen is if I don't go into depth. Raise your hand if you want me to cover something where I didn't. Okay, so that way I get a clue as to like, no, people don't know what glycogen is. The next thing to know is that you're going to be following while you're out there and also before you leave to go on the mission, a lower fat diet. And this is important because the fat that comes into the picture in terms of if a person wants to go have, say, less than nutritious food. The time to do that is after, okay? So um, I'll just give an example of less than nutritious food. Deep fried would be an example. And I'm not saying don't eat deep fried food. I'm saying don't eat it before, don't eat it during. Okay, and, um, and, and Patty... Uh, Patty pointed something out because I had leftover pizza on my handout 
and she said, that's not going to sit well in people's stomachs. So I took it off. Now, some people are going to say, it sits fine in my stomach. I could eat that when I'm going out the door, and I only had five minutes notice, and it was there in the fridge. It's so great. The reason I originally had it on my list was simply that it is a common food in people's refrigerators when they open the door and they have five minutes to leave. This thing, the baked potato that's up there, I think it's up there, yeah, leftover baked potato, that's far less likely to be in your fridge. But yeehaw if it was, because that would be such an awesome food to have thrown in the pack in terms of it could have been pre-wrapped in foil. Now, you don't know when you're going to get called out. But if, if you're in the season, which I'm assuming is not this time of the year, where you're getting called out all the time, you might want to consider having three baked potatoes in your fridge um, anytime you are making them anyway. So I'm not saying every week you're going to bake all these potatoes. I'm saying if you are going to eat a baked potato that week, why not have extras in the fridge? Because they're hugely packable. Uh, cyclists that do distance, they carry them. It's a commonly carried food in Jersey pouches. And so that's why I thought I'd bring it up. Because you guys are going to have your own ideas of stuff you pack that I won't have thought of. Go ahead. What about raw baking potatoes? I know a climber who would just eat them raw. I've never eaten one raw, but if you would, I would say there's absolutely nothing wrong with eating raw produce. I might not find that particularly tasty, but I, I'm not saying that other people wouldn't. I don't know. I've never bitten into one, so I can't say. He also smoked at 14,000 feet. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he pulled people off the mountain. He That's did. <laughs> So what is considered a high-carb diet? This is going to depend on you and what else you do for training at the same time of year that you're doing 14-hour missions. So let's say, oh, Patty clued me into this too. She said, some of these people are endurance athletes. They're in different sports, but they're already engaging in other things. Those people would be eating an even high, higher carb diet than what I'm about to lay out. But this has to do with day to day during the time of year where you're going to be called out on missions and you know you're going to get called out on 14 hour missions. You want a 60 to 65 percent carbohydrate diet. Now, if you are also running marathons, you want to kick it up to more like 75 percent of your diet being carbohydrate. Some people are probably in this audience always already thinking, I don't eat anywhere near that percent of carbohydrate in my diet, and I just want you to know that wouldn't be endurance fueling. So I'm not saying you have to, because some people would be uncomfortable, right? We live in, a, in, a, in an era where carbohydrate is considered evil, and so there are people consuming vast amounts of protein um, and... Uh, very high fat intake and have backed their carbs way down. I'm, I just want you to know that for endurance athletics, nothing has ever changed in the world of sports nutrition. It's always been these types of recommendations. So I hope that was helpful when I said you'd go even higher to 75% of your diet being carbohydrate if you were simultaneously training for distance running or distance cycling um, and you were out there doing missions or you know that you're one of the people that always gets called out on the back-to-back -back ones. If that's the case, I'm going to recommend you might want to run in that season 75% of your diet carbohydrates. Go ahead. I mean, I'm sure there's no specific answer to this, but... How many additional hours a week of training would you say, okay, now it's time to kick it up to 75? Great question. So I don't know how much free time you have during that time of year to where you have a whole bunch of time to also train in another sport. You might say, that is my training. I'm not also doing 20-mile run right before a marathon simultaneously. But some people might be. 
because they are gearing up for a marathon and they might feel like that wasn't adequate training just doing the mission because I wasn't maintaining my pace in running and I'm not convinced, my brain is not convinced that I'm ready to go for the marathon. And I'm only using marathon as an example. It could have been a century ride, okay? So it didn't have to be a marathon. And nowadays in gravel grinding, it's not even a century ride anymore. It's 200 milers in a day. So, okay, so that's what things have evolved to, meaning road cycling, dead sport. Gravel grinding, huge. Um, but yeah, it's 200 milers now, and, and that would be an example of endurance athletics. And um, some people are going to be doing both. That and performing for search and rescue. Next thing. You might say, what is 60 to 65% of the diet carbohydrate? And the answer is it's four to five grams of carbohydrate per kilogram. Does anyone want me to write that on the board? Yep. So it's this really important concept. I just said kilogram. I didn't say per pound. And this is where people get really confused because they'll come to see me in my office and they'll be like, Oh, but I'm consuming 1.4 grams of protein per pound. And I'm like, that was never the recommendation. Whoever gave you that, it was per kilogram. But that's what things have gotten to in the world of paleo diets and keto and um, misinformation on the internet. There's no other way for me to describe it, except for people go, I don't know, I found it on the internet. So that's what 60 to 65% of the diet looks like in terms of it coming from carbohydrate. And we're still on prior. We haven't even moved beyond prior fueling. Um, but these are just some basic concepts before we jump right in. So I know you know to choose easily digestive foods in, right before you go out the door. Let's say you have time for a meal. Because Patty said you might. You might have time for a meal. If so, pasta, rice, potatoes, a sandwich, oatmeal, a burrito with eggs and potatoes, fruit with cereal and yogurt, or a bowl of cereal. And you guys would know better whether or not you have time to make food or not before you get called out. That's something I was just thinking you might if you did. These are commonly um, available foods in a person's home that might already be pre-cooked. You could have leftover rice in the fridge from last night's dinner. You might have leftover pasta in the fridge. It's just a possibility. Um, I doubt you would have a ready-to-go burrito unless it was a frozen burrito and you could heat it up real quick before you left. Otherwise, I doubt you're gonna be able to get your hands on one just ready to grab. But making a sandwich is fast, it's really fast. And some of the um, frozen burritos might be perfectly edible. I don't know, I can't say. <laughs> I'm not a good source on this. But people might have frozen waffles in their freezer and they might have frozen pancakes. All these things are really important right before you leave the house. And if you don't mind making the waffle or the pancake and then pre-packing it and putting it in your pack, you don't have to eat it right now. It's not going to go back into a frozen state. It might not be as delicious as straight out of the toaster, but it's going to be edible. So I would say make use of that kind of stuff in terms of packing enough carbohydrates to take with you. So if for some reason you were given two hours notice, let's just say you were, you're going to shoot for 0.5 to 2 grams of carb per pound. So I just switched gears on you, which is, you might notice, pretty close to this, right? Yeah, mathematically. But just to be clear, if, since this is prior, we're on prior, if you had two hours notice, You'd be at 0.5 to 2 grams carbs per pound in your meal. 
the meal you consumed before you left because you had notice. If you didn't have that kind of notice, oh, by the way, this equates to 60 to 80 grams of carbs. That's what that's equal to. Um, and you might say, no, it's not. I weigh, weigh more than that. Okay, then factor it up, meaning if, if you weigh way more than that, then you'd be at 90 to 110 grams of carbs. I hope that was helpful, meaning there's no way to create class content based on every single person's body mass being entirely different in this room. Yeah? I'm trying to wrap my brain around 60 to 80 grams of carbs. Is that a, what, what the service Yes, yeah. great. Okay, so we're just going to do some exchanges. What's an exchange? 15, remember, everything's 15 grams of carbs. One slice of bread, 15 grams of carbs. Half of a cup of cooked pasta, 15 grams of carbs. Same thing if it was rice. They fit in the same measure. Same thing if it had been quinoa. Um, otherwise, you're going to read packaging because a lot of these things are going to be packaged foods like the pancakes in the frozen box. It's going to tell you how many grams of carbs that is. Your cereal is going to tell you. In one cup, you're going to get 45 grams of carbs. The type of cereal that would be is shredded wheat. Just so you know, shredded wheat's 45 grams of carbs in one cup. If you get into flakes or something else, it's not going to be anywhere near 45 grams of carbs, and it's because they're taking up space in the measuring cup, and they're kind of light and fluffy. But dense cereal, you're going to get a lot further in terms of how much carbs are in it. Okay, then let's talk yogurt. So sweetened yogurt might have just from sugar grams alone 15 grams of carbs. So we know that a yogurt is going to have much higher carb grams than 15 grams of carbs because where's the rest of the carb grams coming from that didn't come from the sugar in it? A glass of milk. So a glass of milk is made into yogurt. It's in no way altered. When milk is made into yogurt, it's an identical food. So it still has the exact same carbohydrate content in the transition from milk to yogurt. It's 12 grams of carbs per cup. So they now make little yogurt thingies that are nowhere near a cup, right? They keep shrinking in size. They're not even six ounces anymore, which is three quarters of a cup. But you can find yogurt easily where it's going to come out to close to 30 grams of carbohydrates in one of those little cups. And everything's got a label. So that makes life really easy. But you asked a really good question. What if it was a food without a label, like pasta left overcooked in the fridge? Then it gets a little more complicated. You have to practice when you're not going out on a mission and learn how much carbs is in food and a really good resource to use, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with these kinds of things, is you can use phone apps, and what I mean by that is like MyFitnessPal, and um, they will tell you how many grams of carbs is in any food you're eating. Then the question becomes, which phone app is actually got an accurate database within it? And what a database means is a nutritional database. And the problem with some of the apps that people use to try to teach themselves nutrition information is that the content was generated by users. So that doesn't mean it's accurate. But I'm going to write down websites where the information is accurate, just so that you don't leave here curious with where to get accurate information. So the USDA's website has a nutritional database that's accurate. You would never have to question the content of it. And then one that's considered completely viable in terms of who's putting in the information into the nutritional database is Spark People. So I know it's a strange name, but um, at least they don't have a crop motive, and that's why I was in terms of their uh, nutritional database. So practice at home, and that will help you in terms of what is 60 grams of carbs. But I think it was helpful to learn that a glass of milk, meaning an 8-ounce glass, is 12 grams of carbs. And then we went over some commonly eaten foods, and I gave you portion sizes and what's one carb choice. So you know the little red potatoes um, that are much smaller than a russet? 
the small sized potatoes are 15 grams of carbs for one small one. So that's helpful because the russets are gigantic and they're far more carbohydrate than small little red potato. And that helps people gauge. Okay, so the next piece of this is you don't have two hours notice. Instead, you've got less than one hour. And now we're into a new subject, which is I don't know how much you can digest and not have upset your stomach if you have less than one hour notice to be called out. So for this, I'm recommending just 30 to 60 grams of carbs so that you can practice on what sits right in your stomach. And 30's on the low end, but not all the people in this room have the same body mass. So see if you can even go higher <clears throat> to 75 grams See if it sits right in your stomach. Because <coughs> we're talking meal here. So I'm only talking to you about the carb grams. And that's because what's the definition of a meal? Well, it would also include protein. Meaning no one eats a sandwich that doesn't have any protein on it. So the definition of san sandwich is protein plus carb. The definition of, I'm just going to throw out some foods, spaghetti with meat sauce. It's protein plus carb. So a lot of people don't necessarily think about that when they eat bowl of cereal, but the milk was the protein, the cereal was the carb. So yeah, mealtime foods, that's what they are. And you don't have to worry about did it have dietary fat in it because most foods do. You're just trying to avoid the high fat foods that won't sit right. And that you're already probably familiar with because you've probably gone out on enough missions to know that Lots of things didn't sit right in your stomach. Next thing. And I got clued into a lot of things from you guys asking questions in advance and what to cover. So here's the next thing. People ask, do they need to carb load? And the answer is, no, you need to follow a high carb diet all the time. And what high carb means is 60 to 65% of your diet coming from carbohydrate. And then you don't have to do anything more than that because how are you going to know that you're about to be called out on a mission the exception would be back-to-back -back ones but i put that into my after fueling category and so since this one's prior i'm just advocating for you regularly consuming enough carbohydrate in your diet so that you don't have to concern yourself with um being in the season and thinking that every night you need to pound on carbs uh, in terms of a, an approach to carb loading. And not everyone agrees with the whole carb loading concept anymore anyway, in terms of as a strategy for endurance athletics. <clears throat> Next one. If you know that you're going to be on a back-to-back -back mission, ideally, Three to four hours before the second mission, you would kick it up to one gram of carbs per hour. I didn't mean per hour, per pound of body weight. So let me write that on the board. You're going to be out there on back-to-back -back missions, and you might say, I'm not going to have three to four hours between them. I know, you have to do this while you're out there on the first mission before the second mission starts. You've got to three to four hours before the end of the first mission and before the beginning of the second mission, you have to increase the amount of carbohydrate you were eating during to one gram of carbs per pound of body weight. So this one is no notice and the answer to this is two GI tolerance. So if you can handle 75 grams of carbohydrate in your gut with all the other food items that you put on a plate at a meal and go out there and move your body, more power to you. Some people can't because it doesn't sit right. And then the next one is back-to-back -back missions and three to four hours before the first one ends.
So that means you weigh uh, 150 pounds. You'd be trying to get in 150 uh, grams of carbohydrate three to four hours before the end of mission number one and the beginning of mission number two. And you might say, that's humanly possible, impossible. I could never pack that amount of food. The answer is going to be this. You have to own carbohydrate fuel. It's a different type of sports fuel than what most people are familiar with. They're familiar with electrolyte drink. They're familiar with recovery drink. This is an entirely different product. It's straight carbs. It's delivering a tremendous amount of carbohydrate in a powder. Why would you care? Because you can't carry enough food for 150 grams of carbohydrate to be eaten three to four hours before the end of the first mission. So you need this powder in your pack. And each serving of it is like 60 grams of carbs. So you don't have to eat all of that food you'd be drinking the carbohydrate. So it's a very valuable thing to own. And there's lots of brands, it's on your handout that everybody got sent. So everybody's got brand names and will now be familiar with what carb fuel is. Okay, that's everything about prior. I'm going into during. So now you're out there and you're trying to uh, not bonk. So you've got to eat by the hour. You have to pay attention to the clock, and every hour you have to eat again. Somebody asked a question before tonight's class of, well, couldn't you just be grazing? Of course you can, so long as you eat everything that the other person was going to eat at the one-hour mark. You have to get it all in within that first hour, because by the time the second hour rolls around, if you're going to take the grazing approach, then you have to be doing it all within that hour. This is every single hour you're going to need 30 to 60 grams of carbs. So now I'm going to erase all the prior stuff and go into during and recommendation for during. So during, you need 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. If you've already experimented on your own and found out that is not enough fuel for you because you have more body mass, then you'll kick it up. Maybe you'll do 75 to 90 and you'll just carry more food in your pack or more carb fuel or whatever you need to keep going. But 30 to 60 grams of carbs sits well in a person's stomach. You're doing it every single hour for the entire time you're out there. Don't get behind. And that's a problem a lot of people run into, is that they're not paying attention to the clock, they don't know when an hour's gone by, or they're more like a nibbler. And the only reason I bring that up is I hang around with a lot of female athletes, and I, I see them nibbling, and I just want to wring their neck um, in terms of they didn't ask for my input. They're not paying me professionally, but I see it all the time. As intensity cre increases, or we could say duration, you have to err on the 60 gram side. So you wouldn't be doing 30 grams. Um, and some of the missions are shorter, and they don't have as long of a duration. They still might have an equal amount of intensity. I don't know, because I haven't gone out with you guys to find out is some of it, you know, standing around, getting a person on a sled. I don't know. But I just want you to know that when people are standing around, no, it's not the same level of intensity as when they're hooking it up the mountainside. Um, and, and you'll know because of how hard you're working. Uh, your hunger will also speak to you. If you're in high heat, your hunger will not speak to you. So you can't go by that. In a, in a hot time of year, many people lose their appetite altogether, and they feel like they're going to vomit if they eat during high intensity, uh, and, and that's a real problem, and they might want to use liquid nutrition at that point. Okay. How are they going to get by? Okay, um, some of the bars nowadays are more paleo-oriented, and so they are, or I, I wouldn't even say paleo-oriented, more uh, targeted towards people who fear carbohydrate. So what's in those bars called protein bars? Protein powder, 
So they're generally made from protein powder itself. They get shaped it into a bar. And they're using sugar alcohol to keep the carb grams low on the bar. So sugar alcohols are really problematic for people's GI distress. And that's because they are indigestible by the human body. So it brings down the sugar grams on the label because if something's indigestible by the human body, then it's a way for it to look like it's low carb or low sugar or whatever in this protein bar category. And I just want to say, avoid the sugar alcohols, you might say. How would I know what's a sugar alcohol? Well, it's a way to sweeten products and the words all end in O-L. And they are strange words, so they're not like, you're not reading a label and going, oh, it's food. Um, it's ingredients. But I just want you to know, don't let that be in your product if you're going to be out there because it can really cause distress. Skip trendy ingredients. What's a trendy ingredient? Well, nowadays it would be collagen. And here's why I say skip it. You can use whatever you want at home. But when you're out there, collagen causes a lot of people's stomach pain. So I would say just because bars get fancy and they want to differentiate themselves, you don't want to go there if you're packing it to take with. I hope that was helpful. I'm not um, here to promote a brand or bash anybody else's brand. I'm just trying to give you some really good information. So anytime you're out for two hours or more, you're going to have to have protein within the mix. Yes, it has protein. Some of the things on the list do, these are commonly packed foods that people would be familiar with anyway. I'm sure people knew that if they put peanut butter on a bagel, that they're going to have protein within the mix. You don't have to be overly concerned about how much protein, so just so long as you're choosing protein, if you're out there for longer than two hours. And you don't have to get wild and crazy with it, and that's because recovery is about something different than what you're doing during. So that concept's really important. So where does protein really come into the picture? In recovery. I'm not saying don't choose it while you're also out there. I'm just saying you don't have to, like, hone how many protein grams to how many carb grams. You just have to include protein. A bagel's a really good choice because it's far more carbs than sandwich bread. So it's bigger bread. And what you'll find when you read a bagel package is that a bagel's more like 45 grams of carbs, whereas two slices of sandwich bread's going to be 30. So I'm not saying not to pack sandwiches. I'm saying throw some bagels in there. They are great forms of carbohydrate. And you can always just stick the peanut butter right on the top of them. You don't have to have them free sliced any. Who cares? Or shoot the peanut butter in your mouth. None of it matters uh, in terms of the right way. So, yeah, go ahead. I, question. I, I know you don't like to stick to one particular brand, but there is that brand Tailwind, and their big thing is, you know, so Tailwind is actually one of the brands I believe that's on this handout. I'm pretty sure it's one of the re uh, recovery drinks. I I don't I How have that I have that handout right here. Uh, Tailwind is an electrolyte drink I recommended, but it was only an electrolyte drink. Meaning the one I'm recommending is called Endurance. And it's entirely an electrolyte drink, so it can't possibly be everything you need for a day. But within the Tailwind line, just like within every um, line of sports nutrition, now I'm talking about powder. In every sports nutrition line, there is an electrolyte drink and a recovery drink. There may also be a carb fuel. That's why I gave you specific carb fuels, is they're rarer. They're more rare. They're harder to get your hands on. The recovery drinks and the electrolyte drinks are a dime a dozen. Tailwind can market itself however it wants, but it's up to you. Do you prefer hammer nutrition? Do you prefer something like um, 
scratch, which has now branched out beyond just electrolyte drink and is now into the world of recovery drink. We're gonna we're gonna go over this. I don't know if we're gonna run out of time tonight, but this was an important thing to be going over. And if you want me to go over it right now and answer to your question, I'm happy to. Otherwise, I'm gonna say, why don't we try to go over this at the end? If that's okay with everybody? Okay, thanks. I don't want you to feel like you weren't being responded to. That's no, I, really I important maybe to me. It's, it's played in with what you were talking about. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want you to be using a mix of powders and solid food, and it's because your pack's going to be too heavy, and there isn't going to be enough space otherwise in your pack. So you're going to absolutely become a powders person because they're light. They're really light. And they don't take up a lot of space. Okay, um, in a hot climate, this is very important because I don't know, there's maybe like one month where it's hot in Colorado Springs. That's my opinion. But other people might debate that and say, oh, no, it's hot for months. I would say, well, you've never lived in Arizona. Um, but more importantly, when it's hot out there and you're out there and you're working really hard, you're going to need protein within your sports drink. And the reason why is that the heat is going to contribute to greater muscle fatigue than what you'd be experiencing if you're even in the cold or in what I would call a moderate temperature, which around here, a moderate temperature might be the 70s. Um, so how could you get protein within your sports drink? Lots of options. All of the give you options, my exception to that is going to be not really in the electrolyte category. So that's really not a category that includes protein. I've got one exception up here, and that is in my electrolyte powders list, I decided to throw in one that had a small amount of protein within it. It's got five grams of protein. It's called Accelerade. None of the other electrolyte drinks utilize protein. But that's why some people prefer to not be dependent on just electrolyte drink when they're going to be out there for a really long time, they're going to also have carried recovery drink. So the reason they're carrying recovery drink with them during um, exertion or endurance, either one, is that they found they do much better with more protein in their mix. And so I gave options. Meaning, just because these products are called recovery and they're designed for after, people use them during. And it's because they prefer that. They've noticed improved performance, whether they are gravel grinding or whether they are doing distance missions. If people have already noticed, hey, they do so much better when they've got protein within their drink, then I'm saying there's no rules. All drinks are up for grabs in whatever way you want to use them. Next thing, we're moving into after, just to see if we can get through all three of these categories in the amount of time that we have. So for after, this is all about preventing muscle fatigue and soreness and for you to have top performance day to day. There's something called the one hour window. Within 15 to 60 minutes of completing the mission, you actually have to have gotten your hands on food. Hopefully that's possible because if you have to wait longer than that, then drink your recovery drink <coughs> you brought with you or eat the stuff in your pack, whatever you got to do. But the ideal fueling for the, for the one hour window which is within 15 to 60 minutes of finishing that mission, is a three to one ratio of carbs to protein. And you might say, what does that even mean? And the answer is, they used to recommend a four to one ratio, but a lot of people are moving to a three to one ratio just because they're finding that they do better with more protein in the mix. Okay, so a three to one ratio is say 90 grams of carbs, and you get the whole idea, 30 grams of protein. So what's 30 grams of protein? It's not a lot, right? Because 
when you go in a restaurant, what's the portion size of, say, the chicken breast they're sticking on your plate? Oh my gosh, it's so huge. But if you had just chosen a three ounce serving size of chicken, which is the size of your palm of your hand, you'd already be looking at 30 grams of protein. So everything's getting overplated today, right? They're breeding the chickens so they have these massive breasts. And people are consuming vast amounts of protein. Is it above and beyond their body's needs? Uh, based on the food records that show up in my office, I would have to say, yeah, but protein's very popular right now, and that's because carbohydrates are not. They are not popular. But this is a three to one ratio. Does everyone need 90 grams of carbs in this room? No, there's plenty of people that at their, in their one hour window, they're gonna be doing 75, right? Or even 60. And it's all fine. It's dependent on your body mass. And um, don't let your appetite decide how much food you need in the one hour window. And here's why. Oh, you're gonna be eating again. You're going to repeat this two hours later. So in order to have optimal recovery, it's not about just the meal you go to the Mexican restaurant for to pig out as soon as you come off the mountain. This is about you have to eat all over again two hours later, and you've got to take in a whole nother 50 to 60 grams of carbs. So it's not about volume. It's about optimal recovery. And most people are just kind of going like this right now. But I just want you to know, I want you to feel like a million bucks. That's important to me. And the secret to that is tone it down. And if you want to eat 60 grams of carbs two hours later, go for it. I'm encouraging you to do it again, possibly even two hours after that. <coughs> Meaning that's what the, the day of recovery looks like, is you're spreading it out and you're staying on top of it. Because you can't replenish glycogen with the going to the Mexican restaurant approach and then blowing it off for hours and hours in terms of, well, that was everything I needed. Well, bear in mind, you know, it was deep fried. That slowed how fast you actually received the glucose from that meal and got it back into the muscle. And so dietary fat, that's just the story, is that the more fat in the meal, the slower you're going to empty. And what I mean by that is empty the stomach and benefit from the glucose. I'm not faulting Mexican food. I know, I know males love Mexican food. Um, I, I just know that that's a common thing that people go do after anything. Is, We're going out for Mexican food. You, you know, and, and the burrito is actually a low fat choice. So I just want to point that out, that not everything on a Mexican menu is high fat. It's the deep fried items that tend to be, and the basket of chips that they would set in front of you right away. So when you've got the back to back mission and you already know you do, choose low fat foods after the first mission and, um, and also increase the amount of carbohydrate in the early part of the second mission. We talked about that before. So you'd want in the second part in the second mission, in the early part, you'd want to go higher per hour on your carb grams. Okay, wow, we've got time for Q and A. So, um, oh, you know what? I can answer your question in just one sec. Would you guys rather have me go over this first? Because I didn't. I didn't talk about this. Sure, this one. Okay, and then we'll jump right to. You. Okay, so who uses electrolyte drink? People that are sweating heavily or are out there in hot climates. If you already know you're not much of a sweater, um, then you have less of a need for this. But bear in mind, it's also carb grams, and it makes you drink more water. So w when a beverage is sweetened, Ken Riggs did the research on this, just so you know, they found out that you're more likely to drink. So there is a value to electrolyte drink. I was just pointing out that people are often consuming it all the time, even when there's really almost no sweating involved. And they might want to consider carb fuel in its, in, instead. There's no right way. There's only that some 
of the carbohydrate within carb fuel is longer acting carbohydrate. It's not 30 minute energy. So you might say, really, there's a difference between 30 minute energy and two hour energy? And the answer is yes, big, big difference. So when you buy carb fuel, you're actually getting into some complex carb. People confuse the term complex carb with, they think that means good quality carbohydrate. And so they use the term interchangeably with good quality carbohydrate. And they go, oh, complex carbs, you mean like whole grains and not straight starch. Straight char starch would be white bread, uh, white rice. Uh, but no, that's not what it means. Complex carbohydrate just means two hour energy. So it's not being burned instantaneously. And simple carbohydrate just means fruit and any form of sweetener that's caloric. So there's sweetener now that's non-caloric. There's electrolyte drinks that are non-caloric. And I just want you to know, none of you in this room need to be purchasing electrolyte drink that's non-caloric, like none is a brand. But it won't help you to bring that kind of fuel because it'll be taking up space, you'll be carrying the weight, and you'll have no carb grams in your uh, electrolyte drink. So no purpose whatsoever. We're back to, like, my friends that I might go out and exercise with who won't stick anything in their mouth. They also won't drink calories. Um, so don't make that mistake. More importantly, simple carbohydrate is fruit, and any kind of sweetener that is caloric. And that's all those terms mean. It's simple carbohydrate versus complex carbohydrate. But back to carb fuel. Carb fuel is a mix of complex carbohydrates, so slower to break down, and simple carbohydrate, which is 30 minute energy. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't write 30 minute energy. So, you know, some people really like stuff like gummy bears, and they pack them, they take them, or they throw M&Ms in their trail mix, and they like it. I'm not faulting that, meaning you might even want to take some really good dark chocolate out there for its caffeine content, and for its antioxidant potential. But more importantly, just so you know, it's going to get burned in 30 minutes, so it's not long-term fuel. So when you're counting those carb grams that's in the gummy bears and that's in the M&Ms or whatever, just know that that's only 30 minute energy and you can't rely on it in the same way. Oh, and let's say also within your trail mix you had raisins, same thing. You can't rely on that fueling you longer than 30 minutes. So that's just something to know in terms of why carbohydrate fuel is superior to electrolyte drink in certain ways. So carb fuel is not electrolyte drink. Okay, that's an important concept too. So you're out there, you're sweating, and you're trying to not end up with a mineral imbalance. So throwing your minerals off, because it's ugly when that happens. Um, it's one of the bigger mistakes that people make when they have to end up in the medical tent at the end of an event is that they their electrolytes were thrown out of balance and they were out there exerting and they were in heat. So I'm not saying not to bring a mix of fuels. I'm just saying now you know the difference between carb fuel and electrolyte drink. Electrolyte drink is just minerals. It happens to also have some carbohydrate in it, but it is simple carbohydrate. Carb fuel is a mix. It does not contain electrolytes. It's a way to not have to have carried so much solid fuel. Recovery drink. It, I only gave the names of ones that were offering the three to one ratio. Are there ones out there that offer, say, a four to one ratio? I'm sure there are. Is four to one going to mess you up? No, I'm just saying that nowadays the logic is a three to one ratio versus a four to one ratio. And yes, you can use recovery drink during. Okay, we got to all that. 
go ahead with the question you have. Um, yeah, you may throw me out of the room, but can you uh, talk about fats and where they may play in this? Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't, I, bring it up is... I wouldn't throw you out of the room because salami had fat in it. Uh, jerky was going to have fat. Hard-boiled eggs were going to have fat. Pudding cups were going to have fat. Cheese was going to have it. Salami. So there's plenty of fats within here. And, oh, we did end up with the leftover pizza slice. How did that get on here? My handout was flawed. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, there is dietary fat over here. This type of muffin that I was suggesting, it's just because, oh, my gosh, this is like the best muffin that's out there on the store shelf. It is so good, and it doesn't have to be refrigerated. It would have plenty of dietary fat in it because... It's made from ground flax seeds. It doesn't mean it doesn't have complex carbohydrate. Also, it's just they use ground flax seeds as part of the flour. It's super tasty, and um, you'll never find a better tasting muffin that's out there in terms of what to own and keep in your freezer for the day you get called out on a mission. They don't have to be kept frozen, but for you to store it long term for the day you need it for a mission, you're going to freeze it. And then it can be outside of refrigeration. The whole time you're on this mission for 14 hours, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. I was just talking about long-term storage. So they come in four packs. Every flavor is spectacular. I love that product line. Um, and it will be calorie dense, so it's nice. Back to your question about dietary fat. Let, yeah, so, let me just expand a little if it's OK. Yeah, please. Um, Lots of bars have plenty of dietary fat within them, like a bobo. Do you guys know bobo? They are calorie dense. They are extremely filling. They're like eating a bowl of oatmeal. They're that filling. And they are a great product. Um, I only have five minutes left. I better pass out samples. Um, Pam, can you help me with this? Um, but there's lots of stuff with fat, in it, and please pack it with you. What, was it a good enough answer, or should we make sure we Maybe get to we it next time? we can expand on it when you return. You'll write a note? Um, yeah. Thanks. And, um, I mean, I carry a jar of peanut butter. Oh, and what a perfect thing, yeah. because you're going to be out there a really long time. Why not carry a jar versus those silly little to go eat in the winter. Yeah. So we may be sitting on a, on a mountainside for three, four, five hours waiting for the crew to get to us. Gotcha, and you're just trying to stay warm. You're just trying to stay warm. Okay, we're going to talk about it. This was a really good point. I had no idea you ever stood still for that kind of oh, length yeah. of time. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you, got, you guys were all standing out there standing still while I got to run during the rescue run, and I have to say, <laughs> I don't know how you did it. It was like three degrees. We can go different extremes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, so, you have choices. I brought bars. They're paleo. I was not bashing paleo. Please don't put that in the Some people might want to try a paleo bar. Your choices are paleo bar or Bobo Mini. And Pam's coming around just to make sure everybody gets a food sample tonight. Um, and I'm going to take a note on the thing that you brought up for next class so that we make sure we get to it. Okay, I need to know everything we didn't cover or Patty can send it to me because I'm not coming back for two months, so we got plenty of time. But everything that did not get addressed tonight is going to be class number two. Plus there were some things on the original um, things you wanted covered tonight, like somebody wanted vegetarian and how to do that. and. Um, we were going to do the aging athlete. And there were just a few other miscellaneous things. I already know about those because they got sent to me. I'll just give you a quick rundown on what those were. The things that are going to get covered next time um, definitely are what are the dangers of energy drinks? Now we're talking about stuff like Red Bull. I knew about it. We're covering it next time. Um, the vegetarian diet. Um, what are the pros and cons of energy supplements and protein powders and drinks? We're covering it next time. 
and then getting older without getting old. But anybody who wants to throw anything out now that they would really like covered next time, go for it. So, particularly in the summer, the majority of uh, our missions, we get spun up during the day. So we're leaving from work, and we don't have access to... You don't get to go home. Okay. So, we make some suggestions on the best foods to, you know, most of us rely on bars and things like that, but uh, suggestions on stuff that you can keep in your pack that are you know, stable that you can keep for a long time. And feel free to pull things off that list, ideas. Um, in terms of those were um, things, many of those things were things that were able to stay in the pack. Not all of them. Some things would go bad, right? And you'd have to be monitoring. Like, let's say you kept bagels in your pack. You'd have to be monitoring. Oh, I never went out. The pack's just sitting here. Let me change out the bagels. He's incapable of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, at least two years. Okay, and then I just wanted to, to mention one other thing. Patty thought that in that instance you might get to go by a supermarket. Not true. Rare. Rare. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So I was just going to ask, are there any drive through or quick serve restaurant options that make any sense at all? Oh, you mean if you um, had the time? Yeah, we, if we have 10 minutes and we're driving by, is there any restaurant we should run into or start? Like, is it a, is it a burrito from Chipotle? Is it a fuzzy? Okay, and so since Chipotle, you'd have to go inside and there's no drive through Should I leave it off and only discuss drive through You can. You can get in and out of there in five minutes. Fair enough. So we'll, we'll include fast casual. So it's already here waiting for you. Okay, and what do they call this place? Base. Was there enough samples for everybody? No, it was, we were like too short. We were too short? There you go. Do you want it? No. You, 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 okay, fair enough. Thank you for helping our cameraman. And I will know next time to bring more um, than what I brought tonight. This was a really good turnout, by the way. We weren't sure what we were going to get. And I didn't count out the eaches to find out exactly how many I had with me, but I'm glad I got that close. Say it again. Okay. The samples are going to be different next time. They're going to be really fun. And um, we already have a whole plan for it. So anything else I should put? Or do you want to just convey to Patty the other thing? Yeah, what I will do is I'll send out an email. Um, I'll send out an email. You can just forward to me. Um, at this point, I'm going to be tossing around her next class with EMR practice sessions and skills testing. So I'm still playing with that. Um, I think from Mark will be back in the third month of April with the EMR practice skills on the third Wednesday of next month. Uh, that way, we'll get the EMR out of the way um, fairly soon. So if that doesn't work out, then we'll move we'll on back next month. I'll sort this out in the next week or so. Yeah, I can come in March if you decide you want me in March. Um, really quick, I don't know if you're wondering, but I'll just tell you. These are recipes up here of how to work with things like beans and um, nuts within recipes, fish recipes. I only bring good literature. I don't bring junk. So, I don't know if you get like two minutes before the class starts, the next part, but if you want to come up here and grab anything you want, feel free. If you're not interested, my feelings won't be hurt. Thank you.
Thanks for having me. Thank you.